Hello, hello. Good evening or late afternoon, everyone, where you are joining us from. Uh, thank you so much for jumping in on time, and some of you maybe even a little early. Uh, this is Tafari Melisizwe, the communications coordinator for the Dignity in Schools campaign, and just welcoming you all into the room as you log in. Uh, super excited for your presence tonight to deal with this uh, extraordinarily uh, what do I want to say? Uh, emerging subject, as the title implies, um, in our work um, and in people that are doing work that we know. Um, and so just wanting to welcome you all. Um, so again, thanks for signing up and coming in. And uh, we will get started uh, with the presentation and webinar shortly. Uh, we're going to give folks another minute or two to keep logging in and signing on, and then we're going to get everything started. So again, welcome and uh, sit tight. Pull out your notepad, your notebook, your questions, those kinds of things as we go through the presentation. Um, really excited to see uh, where this discussion goes. Also, just want to point your attention to a couple of things if this is your first time in this platform uh, for webinars. There should be on the right-hand side of your screen um, a few drop-down menus where you can chat and ask questions. And uh, we definitely encourage you as the presentation uh, goes on and ensues during the evening to use that question tab. And if there's some conversation pieces or things that you're interested in talking through, to um, feel free to um, jump in there as well. Just saying welcome again to the new attendees that have joined in the last minute or two. Um, again, this is Tafari Malasizwa, Communications Coordinator for the Dignity in Schools campaign. And just excited and grateful to have you in the, the digital room uh, for this webinar tonight that we are facilitating in concert with uh, the Midwest Center for School Transformation and Data for Black Lives. We're going to get started momentarily. I just wanted you to hear a voice so you didn't log in and wonder what was going on. We're getting ready to start momentarily. Actually, on that note, um, we're going to begin. Welcome, everyone. Thanks for your interest and for participating in this Emerging Trends in Education webinar on the Cradle to Prison Algorithm. We want to acknowledge and say thank you to our contributing organizations and individuals who have contributed and responded to the urgency of getting this information into the hands of parents, youth, and community members. Next slide, please. Um, again, we want to th say thank you and acknowledge the contributing organizations and individuals. In particular, we want to say thank you to the Midwest Center for School Transformation, the Twin Cities Innovation Alliance, Dignity in Schools Campaign, Data for Black Lives, and the Coalition to Stop the Cradle to Prison Algorithm. <laughs> 
First, I'd like to cover some housekeeping items before we begin. Uh, to let you know, this webinar is being recorded. Following the webinar, participants will receive a link uh, to the recording, and we ask that you share this information far and wide because we know everybody is not going to be able to participate in the webinar this evening, but we believe this information is critical. Therefore, we want to get the word spread. Um, you'll take note that handouts are provided. A link will appear in the chat box to your right um, for you to follow and access the handouts. You can uh, download the PDFs. Also, we want you to know that we will be taking questions for this webinar. Feel free to submit questions anytime in the chat box. At the end of the presentation, we will respond to questions. We may not have time to answer all of the questions you raise, but we will follow up and share additional responses where appropriate. Next slide, please. So my name is Marika Pfefferkorn, and I am honored to be with you tonight uh, as a moderator and speaker to present on the topic of an emerging trend in education, the cradle to prison algorithm. This work is really personal for me because I have family members that have been directly impacted by the school to prison pipeline. And to think about the complexity of the cradle to prison algorithm and how it will have implications for generations to come, I really believe this is critical work. And I'm so uh, gra grateful that many of you have joined us tonight to participate in learning more and share your concerns as well. Next slide, please. I'm excited that we have Yeshmabet Milder as a special guest speaker for this webinar. She brings a background of organizing and understanding of big data, and it's a critical intersection of skills and knowledge at this time, and we'll be hearing more from her later. Uh, but we have a bio for you to uh, review and learn more about her incredible work on data with Data for Black Lives. Next slide, please. Thank you. So in addition to, uh, it is important to acknowledge the work and preparation that went into bringing this webinar to life. A multitude of thank yous are in order for Zakia Sankara Jabbar, Tafari Melosizwe, and Yeshmabet Milner for their time, commitment, and recognition that this is a story that needs to be told. Next slide, please. In addition to the national webinar planning team, it is important to lift up the work that is taking place here at the local level in St. Paul that informs this webinar. The individuals listed are members of the coalition to stop the cradle to prison algorithm. This coalition was created as a way for parents, youth and community members to work together to oppose the joint powers agreement, which you will hear more about later. It is worth noting that this coalition is made up of folks working on both sides of the system against the cradle to prison pipeline on the criminal and juvenile justice side and the education side. And for us, this is a unique union and we are excited to be in this place, space with each other. Um, we uh, want to let you know that we believe the cradle to prison algorithm is a complex topic and we understand that it will take more than one webinar to unpack what is happening what is at stake, and what we can do about it. And that is why we are planning a series of webinars to explore the expanding role of big data and mechanized technology in education. The Emerging Trends in Education webinar are intended to be shared as tools to inform and engage parents, youth, and community members on the critical topic and spark further discussion about emerging trends in technology impacting education and more specifically our children and families. Next slide, please. We hope you will save this date. The Twin Cities Innovation Alliance and Midwest Center for School Transformation are hosting an all day community summit on the cradle to prison algorithm, November 10th to deepen the discussion and learning around big data, algorithms, and predictive analytics in education. We are excited to announce that we have secured sponsorship for this event from the Dignity in Schools campaign and the Communities for Just Schools Fund. While this event is local, we welcome national participation. If interested, 
Email me for more information, and my contact information is provided in future slides. Yashma Bet Milner will be joining us in the Twin Cities as a guest speaker, in addition to a host of other local and national presenters. So please save the date and join us. So we have been really intentional about what we wanted to share in this first webinar. We don't want to overload people with information, but if we are able to deliver on the following objectives, we will consider this webinar a success. As a result of participating in this webinar, it is our hope that you will walk away with the following. A better understanding of what the cradle to prison algorithm is, a better understanding of the technical language associated with data, algorithms, and predictive analytics, a better understanding of the risks associated with mechanized technology and education, and a better understanding about how the cradle to prison algorithm may show up or already has shown up on your doorstep in community and what you can potentially do about it. Next slide, please. So data is the new currency. I think it is important to ground this conversation with the understanding that data is the new currency and that the data of children and families is a highly valued commodity. Keep this in the forefront of your mind as you think about who benefits from the use of big data and predictive analytics beyond our public systems that are applying them. Next slide, please. So in planning this webinar, we thought it would be important to begin with a local example, but making sure to connect the dots between what is happening in St. Paul and what is emerging in school districts across the country. We know that we are not the first people that are experiencing this. For us, the story begins in the county attorney's office and ends with a cradle to prison algorithm. I will be sharing information on an unprecedented legal agreement, multiple jurisdictions, including St. Paul schools, the city of St. Paul, including St. Paul Police Department and Ramsey County, including probation, prosecutors and social services have agreed to a large scale data sharing initiative, which we believe allows these same agencies to tear down privacy protections and share protected information. The outcome being a tool to identify children suspected of being at risk of future criminal behavior. Hence the origin of the cradle to prison algorithm, which we believe is an expansion of the school to prison pipeline by criminalizing students younger and younger through a predictive formula, which will tell us who succeeds what success looks like, or potentially the complete opposite. What happens to students when they are assigned a risk score and all we see is the odds stacked against them or the bias that permeates decisions in regards to students of color and American Indian students and their families. Our community has been organizing in opposition to this legal agreement, and yet we are only now seeing the magnitude of decisions already set in motion by leaders earlier this spring in our community. Over the course of this webinar, I will share with you public documents presented at board meetings of the governing agencies and school districts, as well as share the public discourse that has framed conversations about the Joint Powers Agreement and how this contrasts with the recommendations that have come from community, highlighting the general lack of understanding about the Joint Powers Agreement across agencies and between leadership and decision makers. We want to, if nothing else, alert communities and call out problematic practices that harm kids without resolving system generated disparities. This data sharing agreement relies on identifiable rather than aggregate data for programming and policy decisions, which is contrary to national best practices on interagency coordination, which is targeted and specific to concrete problems and outcomes. What is at stake is bigger than St. Paul and has the potential to permeate education at large. Our communities oppose the data sharing agreement, which will function, as I've said, as the cradle to prison algorithm by racially profiling children as future criminals, stigmatizing children and families, diverting system resources towards study and surveillance rather than services, and ignoring 
our system responsibilities for current disparities. Next slide, please. So why do communities oppose this data sharing agreement? We will dig deeper into the data sharing agreement itself later in the webinar, but it is important to understand that this is not a knee-jerk reaction from community members and advocates who are afraid of new ideas. We are justified in our pushback on the data sharing agreement, and we will share more about that with you shortly. This legal agreement allows for the broadest possible sharing of data among institutions, including schools, probation, law enforcement, and prosecution that have historically overreached and overpunished poor communities and communities of color. This agreement opens the floodgate to children's and families' data without protections for privacy or grievances. And this is among agencies who have already struggled to safeguard our children's information. This legal agreement does not outline prohibitions to accessing or sharing data and information with law enforcement or ICE. This legal agreement specifies that the first agency to collect, access, and manage the data is the National Council on Crime and Delinquency, an agency that develops correction systems management tools like risk assessment instructions or instruments. The joint powers agreements are intended to facilitate service delivery and coordination between government agencies and yet it structurally excludes community participation in governance and oversight. No community members will be allowed to sit at the table to provide oversight for this agreement. So there appears to be more questions than answers. So for example, right now what we're grappling with here locally is what does this mean for tribal sovereignty and Indian education programs in districts? This may actually be a violation of federal law, and we are still exploring what this means. Another concern that has been raised from the community sessions that we've held locally is that what about families? Are they able to opt out? And if they do opt out of this data um, agreement, what happens to students? One of the questions that came up in St. Paul when we were having a community forum was that if parents opt out of the data sharing agreement for their child, particularly, is it possible that they would not receive technological materials that are distributed through the school district? So one of the parents asked, will my child be able to have an iPad if they do not sign the agreement? So there are a lot of concerns that we are grappling with here locally that we know we don't have all the answers, but we certainly know that there is a great deal of uh, people across the country who are thinking about this and we wanna engage with them further. Next slide, please. I also just wanna pause for a moment for those of you that have just joined um, this webinar um, or just as a reminder that if you have questions along the way, Please share them in the chat box. We will be following up later in the webinar and we will do our best to answer the questions. So what are the growing community concerns around this joint powers agreement and how is it connected to this concept of the, um, of the cradle to prison algorithm? So at a high level, opposition to the legal agreement includes critique and feedback from civil rights and civil liberties attorneys nonprofit organizations, advocates for youth and justice, and parents and family members. Notably, the Joint Powers Agreement makes no commitment for systems to correct or address racial bias. This intervention type is not specified in the agreement or nor are funds dedicated for support, including the long-term storage of data, which is quite expensive. The Joint Powers Agreement lacks prohibition on the use of data, which is actually quite common in other juvenile justice collaborative efforts in order to actually safeguard protections for children. 
Our joint powers agreement has no termination date, and that data sharing continues even if one agency decides to pull out or when the children have grown up and they're adults, what happens to that information in the system and can it still be used against them? We question also where the money is coming from. St. Paul Public Schools has experienced a significant deficit and has already had to make deep cuts to programs and services. So is this an either or? How are we actually funding it? Is it possible that we can do both? And what are the impl implications for that? So also, the Joint Powers Agreement authorized the National Center on Crime and Delinquency to develop a data sharing platform and predictive tool, but does not specify how it will be applied or what intervention will be triggered, leaving this open-ended use of data being very problematic. The potential actually is very high and that it will amplify existing racial bias that is built into algorithms. This joint powers agreement extends the power and reach of law enforcement and the county attorney's office here locally, integrating access to the data that they would not otherwise be able to use. And again, this is students and families across St. Paul schools, across the city of St. Paul, as well as Ramsey County and their multitude of departments. This data sharing agreement will create the most powerful data platform in the county and create incentives for the parties to access and use down the road, again, for unspecified interventions and applications in what has been consistently deemed as a prevention model. This agreement makes children and families vulnerable to changing political agendas through a permanent entity governed by political leaders who will change over time. One of the arguments that we've been getting locally when we push back up at the agreement is that the people that are involved with the Joint Powers Agreement that are associated with this work or that will be leading and driving it as staff members are trustworthy and understand community concerns. That to us is not a concern because again, it's not about an individual, it's about systems and practices that are in place. And this is a problematic mindset because that person might be here today, but gone tomorrow. We're also concerned that it focuses on predicting individual children's behavior rather than the disparities of systems driven by the bias that we have outlined already. So advocates for the Joint Powers Agreement insist that predictive analytics is not central to this agreement that we're grappling with in St. Paul and that the agreement would proceed even if a decision is made not to proceed with the predictive analytics, which is doubtful because it is intrinsically embedded in this joint powers agreement. And yet, as I said, predictive analytics appears throughout public documents and the agreements itself. Next slide, please. So the question is, for us to share with you all, how did we get to this place in 2018 where we are so concerned about this data sharing agreement? The Joint Powers Agreement has been a work in progress for over four years and parallel processes actually have been in play and existed that have not included community or all of our governing agencies did not know that these conversations were taking place and they were not actually at the table. So what we have provided for you is a bit of a breakdown of the timeline of how this process evolved and who was engaged and involved in it. So the origins of this joint uh, powers agreement began in 2015 with a community in innovation grant from a local foundation for the Ramsey County Attorney's Office to, quote, engage the community to build a new economic model of comprehensive, coordinated service delivery to improve outcomes for young people. The grant funded community conversations over the course of a year focused on upstream and alternative approaches to juvenile detention and incarceration in Ramsey County. As a result of the community conversations hosted by Marnita's Table and a Ramsey County School Safety Task Force, 
the Ramsey County Attorney's Office proceeded to use the community process to advance and legitimize data sharing across public institutions and presented this approach as the leading recommendation from community. Repeatedly, community members represented at the tables that I mentioned, Marnita's table and the Ramsey County School Safety Task Force. Uh, so they, we have community members that were represented at these tables, and they are pushing back on statements that the recommendation to do the data sharing agreement originated from community. This is not the case. In fact, many of the members of the community that sat at those tables were concerned about how their feedback would be used or if decisions had been made and they were just asking to, being asked to participate in the conversation, although they already knew decisions were made. So the Ramsey County Task Force, to be clear, never discussed any large scale, open-ended sharing of identifiable data or the use of a predictive tool to, to flag children at risk of future criminal behavior. Actual recommendations from community sessions have not been named or advance. So there is a litany of suggestions that came from community about how they wanted to address challenges that are facing children and families in our community. And to date, we have not seen those recommendations lifted up. The sole outcome of these conversations has been focused on the Joint Powers Agreement and this predictive analytics tool that will be applied. Following the engagement sessions in 2016, the Ramsey County Attorney's Office entered into a contract with the National Council on Crime and Delinquency to create a predictive tool and a triage referral system that assigns children risk scores. Again, the National Council on Crime and Delinquency is an agency that develops correction systems, management tools like risk assessment instruments. This agreement was established prior to the Joint Powers Agreement. Next steps involved were they held a feasibility study and the development of a legal strategy and promotion of the Joint Powers Agreement to elected and decision, elected um, be members of the uh, governing bodies and decision makers. So the Joint Powers Agreement was approved by all three public entities in spring 2018 with little to no public awareness or discussion or that a, a previous agreements had been made and were in place. So again, this has been extremely problematic because not only has community been left out of many of these conversations, and it's been a very quick process once the decision was made to proceed with the Joint Powers Agreement, but information about how this came to be has been inconsistent against, um, between all of the bodies. And so everyone is not on the same page about what this Joint Powers Agreement was intended to do and what it will do. Next slide, please. So the reason I took a moment to share the timeline is to highlight that parallel processes existed and that information that was shared and relayed across community elected officials and decision makers was inconsistent and less than transparent. But we will focus more on this as we dig deeper into the actual Joint Powers Agreement. And as I mentioned earlier, there is a copy of the Joint Powers Agreement in the handouts uh, portion of the GoTo webinar control panel. You've got the coalition letter that our community members have submitted to elected officials. You have the Joint Powers Agreement in addition to a number of other pieces such as a joint powers agreement question and answer page that was developed by Laura Jones, one of our local community members. So again, you should be able to download those. So we've pulled together these public documents that were shared or presented at city, county, and school district meetings to communicate about the joint powers agreement. It appears that no one, as I mentioned early, earlier is actually sharing a consistent message about what this joint powers agreement is. So the community engagement pro innovation project, although the emphasis has been placed on transforming the way public systems work by developing a new triage system that uses data-driven decision making, it needs to be highlighted that this is a pilot, this is a study that our families and, and, and students and children in the system 
people will be learning about how to apply predictive analytics and how to create appropriate algorithms. The expertise is not there. It has yet to be designed. Um, and we have seen little to no evidence on how the city, county, and school district will actually support children when identified or deemed at risk. So this, these are slides that were presented at whether it was a school board meeting, a city council meeting, or the Ramsey County Commissioner's meeting. So these are not slides that we have created. We went in and we examined the public information that was available to make sure that we had a complete and comprehensive understanding of what was being suggested. Next slide, please. So what could this look like going forward? The next slide um, was used in a presentation to the St. Paul Public Schools Board. It's more about how the information is being presented that this J joint powers agreement, it, it, they're presenting it as if it's a silver bullet. Uh, it's a silver bullet to resolving systemic inequities. But it's notable that a strategy, uh, that there is not a strategy identified for centralized outreach to families for voluntary support. Um, and that the strategies that they've identified as enable centralized outreach to families with voluntary offer of support, um, response from community members as they read that is, is skeptical and also concerned about overreach. What would it look like to have one of the members of the system reach out to a family and say, you know, we understand that your child is, is experiencing some, some, some challenges. Um, we've actually identified a risk score for your child. And because of that, we've got this plethora of um, resources that we'd like to share with you. That can be pretty off-putting and uh, it's concerning to many of our community members about how you would actually go about doing that. Um, next slide, please. It's interesting, um, one of our youth workers that um, engaged with uh, young people around this joint powers agreement, our young people are trying to wrap their heads around what, what this means. And they've had some time to reflect on the conversation. And one of our young people actually said, I was sitting in a classroom and looking around and recognizing that I would have the label of a risk score and trying to determine who in the class would also have a risk score and what that risk score would be. So our young people are processing this information and understanding that it's problematic because they understand that many of the relationships that they currently have already exist through a biased lens. And so understanding that someone's gonna be looking at you and applying a risk score our young people know that folks don't always get it right and they're concerned about what that means. So on the side about executing a joint powers agreement, this again highlights that in public presentations that the purpose of this agreement is to better serve children and families without actually including the recommendations from families or community members who participated in an engagement sessions and the task force. And at the same time, downplays the role of predictive analytics as a key strategy to this particular joint powers agreement. Next slide, please. So in the presentation to boards, there is mention of a triage system that without saying it relies on an algorithmic model that the National Council on Crime and Delinquency will develop as a part of their pilot study in agreement with Ramsey County, producing a risk ratio resulting in a risk score for children. The slide you see before you is an example of how triage is used in other sectors. I would also like to encourage members of this webinar to check out the National Council on Crime and Delinquency. Check out their website. Uh, learn for yourself um, their approach to predictive analytics and the implications it may not just have for St. Paul, but how it might be for your community as well. So later on, Yeshmabet Milner will go more in depth on predictive analytics.
But briefly, predictive analytics is an emerging field in criminal justice to predict risk for future events or behaviors based on the mining of large data, data sets, computer learning, algorithms, and other big technology tools. So our joint powers agreement here in St. Paul names the purpose of the data sharing to predict, predict juvenile justice system involvement and initiate appropriate interventions based on the application of predictive analytics in the child welfare system. So they're creating a triage system that responds to a risk score for children that will prioritize what children's needs are, not necessarily based on the most current up-to-date information, but of patterns of behaviors from the past, which we believe is problematic because if you start with a flawed system, you end with a flawed system. Next slide, please. So under the Joint Powers Agreement, I really hope that you're paying attention to how the uh, governing agencies have approached this. Uh, we believe that a lot of our elected officials signed on to this Joint Powers Agreement and what we hope was that they did not completely understand the complexity of it, that they would not have intentionally done this. But under the Joint Powers Agreement, we don't actually know what data will be used, but we do know that there is no prohibition on the data that will be used. And this again is problematic, but based on public presentations, we've gathered that the potential variables and indicators for scoring and risk may include. So if we think about each of these entities and the data that they have, so the city would be able to be sharing across the agencies the arrest of kids, uh, the arrest of kids' siblings, the arrest of their parents or caretakers, and their interactions with the police. From the county, there is so much information that they would have access to because they did not put any type of prohibition on what the data is that they would be shared. So with the county, it's about the involvement with child protection, which really is problematic with, within a lot of our native communities and they're really concerned about this. It's about the detention of kids and siblings. It's about the detention of parents, parents and caregivers. It's about potential enrollment in welfare or adult incarceration or for school districts. Uh, school districts could potentially be using school suspensions, att um, attendance records, grades, special education status, free and reduced lunch status, or for many, it might just be a zip code which serves as a proxy for race. Um, we just don't know because they actually signed onto this agreement without having any clear sense of what the data would be that would be shared. So uh, next slide, please. Because we don't yet know which data will be used to formulate this risk score, we can only predict how this information will be used and we may not be very good at predicting it. Uh, but a prime example of potential use is student attendance data. So let's say students are scored based on attendance records. Um, will only full, with only full, uh, one full day excused or an unexcused absence will be scored. So in that scoring, a full day is excused would be a score of one for each absence. Uh, so imagine that you missed two weeks of school, even if it was excused. Another potential one would be a full day of unexcused absences, which then would be a score of two for each absence. So why is this problematic? The assumptions or opinions about why students are absent is at the core of my question. Um, how do you manage this variable when some families may call in an excused absence, even though the reason is not excused? or if families are savvy to the system. Who will this actually impact more? What if the reason the student is absent is more about disengagement in the classroom than their ability to learn or motivation for learning? Again, you have to um, operate off of assumptions and opinions, but it is important to question where those assumptions and opinions are coming in from before they are fed into an algorithmic process.
For example, for me, my background is around discipline disparities. And so if discipline data is used, it increases the potential for flawed data to inform the risk score rather than identify the racial bias in teachers and administrators that perpetuate dis disparities. So in Minnesota, the state of Minnesota, last fall, the state, of, state Department of Human Rights delivered letters to 43 school districts and charters, notifying them that based on significant disparities in their student das discipline data, they were under investigation for violating the State Human Rights Act based on the use of suspension for disorderly conduct, conduct, a subjective category susceptible to racial bias. And so if Black students are suspended at greater rates than their peers because of racial bias and not because of a difference in behavior, this corrupts any potential formula for risk scoring. I just want to reiterate, 43 school districts in the state of Minnesota were identified were potentially discriminating in their, their application of discipline based on subjective categories. So if you think about the scoring mod model for discipline, misconduct is only scored if, um, if there are suspensions um, for, for an incident. Um, misconduct scored only if there are suspension days for an incident or for uh, the score sum of suspension days um, is times two. So this is an issue as this category has the potential to oversample certain student groups and does not take into consideration that although students may be sent home, it will not be recorded as a suspension based on different pra uh, differing practices across schools. So a student receiving special education services and has an IEP, an individualized education plan, um, or simply an inaccurate um, reporting, really puts us at a risk for mis, um, misinforming the algorithm. Again, this is only an example of how the data could be used to predict a risk score on the school side of the data sharing agreement. Next slide, please. So the joint powers agreement um, has a broad swath of, um, within the county has a broad swath of departments and agencies involved in this data sharing agreement. The data is vast and unprecedented in the scope of data made available to members of the joint powers agreement. So you hear be, see before you, all of these different entities that have access to the data, whether it's necessary for them to have it or not. The sheriff's office, the county attorney's office, the police department, just to name a few. Next slide, please. So also concerning for us with this joint powers agreement is as a result of the agreement, an entirely new government entity has been created that operates and moves agent and removes agencies from direct involvement and oversight. And this new public entity structurally, as I stated earlier, structurally excludes community participation due to the privacy protections outlined in our state statute here in Minnesota, drawing criticism on the lack of transparency about how this board will operate and what oversight and accountability will this board actually have to community? The agreement has already been signed. And just really quickly, I wanted to remind people that as we go, if you have questions, please place them in the chat. We'll be capturing them and addressing them later. Next slide, please. So we wanna be clear that the stated purpose for the joint powers entity um, and what's not being talked about with this, this new agreement, that this, is, this new public entity was formed for the purpose of developing, validating, or admi administering predictive tests. As I shared in slides earlier, this is not how this data sharing agreement has been portrayed to the public. It has been positioned as a prevention strategy and predictive analytics 
has been secondary. Next slide, please. So how is the data sharing and predictive testing going to happen? Well, it will happen through the National Council on Crime and Delinquency. They will, inf they will analyze information to, de to determine which factors are predictive of school success and juvenile system involvement. Although, again, this has not been explicitly stated in public forums, it is plain and clear in the language of, language of the Joint Powers Agreement. So upon the completion of the integrated data sharing platform and the related work of the council, the parties will continue, but the National Council on Crime and Delinquency will step away and leave this platform to us here in Minnesota. One thing we know about algorithms is that they have to be consistently tweaked because as you learn about how they're operating and you understand how opinions and a bias are playing into it, you have to make corrections for that. And so again, we haven't thought about the long-term strategy of this data sharing agreement that we have locally. Next slide, please. So what hasn't been publicly presented to elected officials and is not being talked about is that the National Council on Crime and Delinquency selected Ramsey County Attorney John Choi's proposal for reducing juvenile justice system involvement through pro predictive analytics. And the county's existing collaborations with the City of St. Paul, the St. Paul School District, and other youth serving programs to target at-risk youth. And for the purpose to create an alert system to target appropriate interventions to prevent future youth involvement with the juvenile justice system. This is not being talked about and was not shared with elected officials, officials or community members. We came across this document in our deep dive for information and it was surprising to many of the elected officials who had signed on and approved this agreement. Next slide, please. So what we're, we've shared here with you is actually a letter to the National Council on Crime and Delinquency. Um, so you can get a sense of how this has been um, building up in the background. So we have, we have compiled significant evidence that the original intention for this joint power sharing agreement at the heart of it is predictive analytics. It is stated explicitly in the letter from the former chair and Ramsey County Commissioner the intent of the agreement is to not is to mine the data of students and families to perform predictive analytics. It is to identify which factors are most predictive of future juvenile justice, justice system involvement. And just as a side note, this makes me think of the movie Minority Report, where individuals were charged with crimes before they were ever committed because of the algorithm that identified them at risk. Next slide, please. So again, we're still grappling with and struggling to wrap our heads around what is the actual data that will be shared. To date, specific data variables have not been defined in the Joint Powers Agreement. And if you'll go to the next slide, please. So as I said, to date, specific data variables have not been defined in the Joint Powers Agreement and have not been publicly vetted. But it is clear that as the agreement sits today, non-district parties may receive under appropriate circumstances, uh, circumstances which are not identified, information from districts that would not be otherwise available to them. The legal agreement leaves a door wide open for information sharing among agencies, including law enforcement. And I have to bring you back to the beginning of the presentation and the presentation that's been shared with the public, which is that this is supposed to be a preventative measure. So the fact that law enforcement is getting this information potentially without reason is highly uh, concerning, which by any means is not a preventative approach. What we do know is that all information pertaining to children collected by the named agencies can be shared in, an, in this integrated data platform created by the National Council on Crime and Delinquency.
and potentially to all parties named in the agreement. It could include education record, le, records, such as I stated earlier, attendance, discipline and suspensions, academic performance and disability status, child and family welfare information on foster care, truancy and runaway information, mental health, chemical dependency, family access to financial services like medical assistance and assistance for cash, food and housing, all child and family contact with ju justice systems, including police citations, arrests, charges, and prosecutions, which include convictions and adjudications, and information on correctional supervision or incarceration on youth and their families. This data sharing agreement is so far reaching. As I stated early, this is earlier, this is unprecedented. Next slide, please. So who has been named to the board? All the current appointees have been named except the city of St. Paul, and that may have changed. I could be wrong, but my last um, um, research on this was that St. Paul had not named their people. Um, community members, as I said early, are not allowed to be on this new board. Um, they're not permitted by state statute. Um, and that this governing board will change based on who is in elected office. The governance of children's information will be subject to changing political agendas. Next step, um, um, next slide, please. So the Joint Powers Board has not yet met formally, but will do so soon. It may be as soon as October. So we are working furiously to disband or dissolve this agreement before that can happen. Before the Joint Powers Board can share data, the other thing that they will need, the next hurdle that they will need to um, uh, proceed through is that they will need approval from the state of Minnesota Commissioner of Administration. So the board has not met yet and they still need approval from the Minnesota Commissioner of Administration. So we still have the opportunity to shut this down. Next slide, please. What we have laid before you is the formula for a cradle to prison algorithm. Here are the next steps for our coalition to stop the cradle to prison algorithm. And there are multiple ways for you to participate, stay engaged and push back. So we talked about, we are having ongoing meetings with elected officials. Um, we are hosting this uh, community summit on November 10th on the cradle to prison algorithm, save the date, um, for the Dignity in Schools Nas uh, National Week uh, of Action on School po Pushout. Locally, we will be hosting a community forum on the Joint Powers Agreement. Um, a suggestion to other members of the community is that you could actually have a uh, a watch party of the webinar and have local community conversations about what concerns it raises for you about your community. So again, the National Week of Action for the Dignity in Schools campaign is October 20th through the 28th. So I encourage you to check out the Dignity in Schools website to learn more about how you can get engaged. I also ask that you share the webinar far and wide to get the message out. Um, one of the steps that we hope we don't have to get to is that we might have to have a potential injunction on this so that they cannot proceed because we, again, cannot believe or understand how it could have such a broad sweeping scope of data. And we do not believe, even if we were to agree with the um, process, that this amount of data should not be shared. So we may have to eventually do a potential injunction. And the other piece is if this um, Joint Powers Board entity proceeds, is that we may have to change state statute here locally to ensure that community members can actually be on the board. Because again, without a community presence, there is not oversight, there is not accountability, and there is not transparency about what is going on with the data, how it's being used. Next slide, please. So my portion of the webinar presentation is just about done, but I want to make sure that if you leave with nothing else, this is possible in your community. It may already be underway.
For us, provisions for the joint powers agreement were not vet vetted in community. So you need to make sure that you're doing your due diligence and making sure that this is not happening behind the scenes. Predictive analytics is at the heart of the cradle to prison algorithm and is problematic. Even more so is the lack of transparency about its role. And so the predictive analytics flawed from the beginning is a flawed outcome and a flawed risk score that does not uh, support prevention measures. A joint powers agreement with this level of data sharing authority is not in the community's best interest and absolutely the joint powers board should be disbanded. If prevention is the key, go back to the community and start again. And one of the greatest learnings that I've had from this process and being in conversation with community and elected officials is that elected officials need to be trained on big data, algorithms, and predictive analytics in order to govern in a manner that is actually protective of our community. We are in a technological age, and if we know nothing else, that there is a lot that our elected officials don't know, but they need to continue to be trained and have better insight about the long-term um, implications that these type of decisions will have for, for generations. We haven't, I don't see any questions coming up in the, in the chat box yet, um, but I want you to think about this question really quickly and you can share your remarks in the chat box. Are you aware of a data sharing agreement in place in your community? or is one in the works? Do you know about anything that's going on the ground? But right now, I'm gonna turn you over to Yeshmabet Milner to give you a better sense and understanding about where the cradle to prison algorithm originates, how to unpack the technical language involved in agreements that include predictive analytics, and provide a historical arc on how algorithms have been impacting communities of color for a long, long, long time. And the absence of historical context leaves communities vulnerable to emerging technological trends in education. Yeshi, thank you for um, um, thank you for being with us today. I'm going to pass it over to you, and I look forward to hearing your portion of the presentation. Thanks, Marika. I appreciate it. I it says that people can hear me, but um, let me know if you guys can hear me. <laughs> um, hi and welcome to everybody out there. Thank you for joining this call. Thank you also for all the work that you're doing, whether you're uh, organizing as part of the Dignity in School campaign, you're a researcher, thank you. Um, as was said, my name is Yeshi Milner. I am founder and executive director of Data for Black Lives. We are a national organization, but based in Cambridge, Massachusetts where we're working to harness the power of data and technology to make concrete and measurable change in the lives of black people. And actually, although this organization started about two years ago, my very first introduction to data collection um, was as a youth organizer in Miami, Florida, working to end the school to prison pipeline. Um, and that's part of the reason why that um, in the work that I do at Data for Black Lives, a big focus is that as um, technology and computational power changes exponentially. We also have to make sure that public policy, in particular American public policy, also progresses and changes. And I say that because in particular around what's happening in Ramsey County and in St. Paul, as well as what's happening all over the country with the weaponization of data, um, I do believe that algorithms and data in a vacuum you know, is neutral, but when you put it in a context of the school to prison pipeline, of generations and histories of racism and oppression, it takes on a whole other meaning. And, you know, I'm going to jump into the slides, but I think we're going to give a great introduction to my presentation. I'm going to get into some of the history behind risk and behind even this idea of a risk ratio. I'll kind of go into the technicalities of an algorithm. Um, how we understand inputs, outputs, as well as the values that go into them. Um, give some examples and kind of end um, um, so that we can get into some questions. So, one second, I'm also going to time myself because I don't want to take up too much time. But yeah, so I started off with this slide because I think that um, we hear the word risk a lot. In fact, you know, I've been hearing the word risk probably since I was in elementary school. 
as I mentioned, I went to school in Miami, Florida. Um, and I remember being nine years old in the fourth grade and sitting in the computer lab, which was not surprisingly my favorite room in our school building. And another student um, who was, I think, a, a little bit older than me, turned to me and told me that she was at risk and that we were at risk youth. You know, I naturally was be bewildered, confused, and a little bit scared, as I think most nine-year-olds would be. And I asked her, how could a person be at risk? How was at, at risk of what? And she told me that she was in an after-school program for at-risk youth. And that in the program, they had told her that she, she was at risk of going to jail, of dropping out. And I just re remember that very vividly because of the way that she was convinced that she was at risk. And, you know, years, years later, you know, I consider myself a survivor of the school to prison pipeline because so many of the young people that I went to elementary school actually did end up in jail and did end up working low wage jobs. And that's not because they were bad kids, but because it became a self-fulfilling prophecy. Next slide, please. So, you know, one of my favorite um, <laughs> good examples of algorithms and machine learning is actually spell check. It's super handy. And I use this to kind of give an example of when we think of the word risk it, in our minds and also in our computational minds, what comes up, right? Danger, jeopardy, peril, menace, threat, probability. Um, but I think also, again, in the context of American public policy, in the context of the world that we live in, risk is often associated with Black youth, Latino youth, Native youth, and poor people. Next slide, please. And in particular, you know, as I'm going to kind of get dig into later on in my presentation, you know, one of my favorite definitions and understandings of algorithms and, and, and the time that we're in is this understanding that algorithms are opinions embedded into code, right? And one of the prevailing opinions um, of the last 20 or 30 years, certainly when I started elementary school and since graduated from high school and gone on to go to college, is this idea of a super predator. You know, during the last election, I saw, we all saw the super predator myth kind of reemerge, a part of the national conversation. But unfortunately, what I thought was a great opportunity to kind of dig into where that comes from and how that term continues to influence policy and decision making. And as we're seeing, data and data driven decision making, um, unfortunately, that conversation didn't happen. But the myth comes out of the work of a social scientist who was a big part of the Bush campaign, John DeLulio, um, who created the notion that a new generation of street cr criminals is upon us. And I quote, the youngest and biggest, baddest generation any society has ever known. Here is what we believe. America is now the home to thickening ranks of juvenile super predators, radically impulsive, brutally remorseless youngsters, including ever more pre-teenage boys who murder, assault, rape, rob, burglarize, steal deadly drugs, join gangs and create serious communal disorders. And I'm gonna go on and, 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 and we'll see even more racially language come in. The problem is that inner city, most inner city children grow up surrounded by teenagers and adults who are themselves deviant, delinquent, or criminal. Next slide. Hello? Okay, thank you so much, sorry. Yeah, so, you know, all of that language was very racially coded and obviously driven by racist opinions that I think were present and have always been present in this country. But this is one of the first times when it was actually embedded into policy, embedded into legislation like the, like the Clinton crime bill, legislation that enacted changes materially for people, but that also drove to a lot of data collection. And later on, as we can see, an increase in the mass incarceration and criminalization of schools. This is an article where years after, you know, campaigning heavily as a politician and as a social scientist, John De Don DeLulio ended up renouncing all of his views and saying that he became a sensationalist. And if I knew what I would have known now, I would have not, I would have shouted for prevention of crimes. I would not have said all that. What he really means is that he was wrong and, be, and eventually all of his views were debunked. But it was too late, right? This had already become a part of the American imagination. It had already become a part of policy. Um, continue. 
Another example of how it was a part was when you think about the crack baby myth, right? And I think this is one of my favorite examples of highlighting how data and how research is, is weaponized and used to justify racist opinions. Um, we were told that it, in the 80s, infants are born addicted to crack, we're gonna overthrow the entire social service system, become such a burden. And this was based on a study that only had 23 participants. Years later, they, they went on and followed up with the participants and was, were surprised you know, to, to show that even some of the young people who were part of that original study had actually defied the odds and went to college and were not these crack babies that um, people had imagined. That it was, again, a lie. Next slide, please. I think the same was also with the welfare cream myth that although this, these ideas began in 1976 with Reagan, it was essential to legislation like um, the, work, the Work and Responsibility Act, which is another Clinton policy in 1996, and also generally how we view mothers, how we view some of our parents that we work with, how, how schools view parents, and how we also understand social services, right? So continue. You know, and I use all of these examples because I really believe, um, you know, more and more and more every day my work with Data for Black Lives is involved working deeply with intelligent machines, working with hands-on with, with data, but even more it's reading history and understanding history because in the age of big data, the world we're in now, which I think Marika so clearly said earlier, if we are not aware of this history, we risk repeating it. And I think this is kind of what we're seeing locally in Ramsey County and St. Paul, but also what we're gonna to begin to see nationally and what we're already seeing. Next slide. So before I get into some specific examples of other ways besides a joint powers agreement and risk ratios that data is being weaponized, I wanna kind of break down what is an algorithm and also what is predictive analytics. So algorithms, we actually interact with algorithms all the time. We use algorithms. The idea of algorithm is pretty ancient. Now in the moment that we're in, when usually when we talk about algorithms, we're talking about computational algorithms. But an algorithm is essentially a, a set of procedures, a set of tasks that allows a computer to complete a total task. So it, it's a recipe that tells you how to do some tasks. And one example that I like to give is um, a recipe that we use for cooking, for example, right? We have our ingredients. Let's say that I wanna make something healthy. I wanna make some spaghetti with some, well, that's not totally healthy, but <laughs> follow me. A spaghetti with some vegetable sauce, right? Our, our ingredients might be pasta, you know, spaghetti sauce and vegetables. Um, but we also, when we're making a recipe, we have a general idea of what success looks like, right? We have an idea of what we want the output to be. If we start off with a certain set of ingredients and end up getting and expecting a spaghetti and end up getting a chocolate cake, that would be a problem, right? But you know, when when we're choosing our ingredients, we're also thinking, asking questions like, what do we want this recipe to be healthy? Do we want it to be delicious? And all of these decisions, all of these values and questions ultimately inform what is the actual algorithm and what the actual recipe is, right? Next slide. So this is a visual that I kind of made just to break it down some more, right? When we're talking about input, we're talking about data. In the example that I just used, we're talking about the actual raw ingredients that it's gonna take to make this delicious spaghetti. In the case, for example, of what's happening in Ramsey County, we're talking about many different forms of data that is gonna be inputted and put into this algorithm, right? And I use a visual for a black box for the algorithm because usually when we're talking about algorithms, in this case, they're intransparent, they're black box processes. There are no legal avenues to actually get under the hood and see what this mathematical model is, what it's testing for, and to actually see if it's going to discriminate. But we usually can tell when an algorithm is going to discriminate when it's actually under such a lock and key, right? So that's what the black box rep represents. And then we have the output, right? So the output really is, um, the final product that comes out of the algorithm, and, the, and I give some examples below. But above are some of the questions that I outlined before, right? These are things that I think often people don't think about, right? When they say, oh, algorithms are neutral, or it's just a mathematical model. 
What goes into algorithm is also this question of an objective function, which is a mathematical term that it really, really, in its most basic form means, what are we trying to optimize in this case? In the case of my recipe, I'm trying to optimize health. I'm trying to optimize, you know, satiating my hunger. So that's going to influence my input, what kind of ingredients I buy, as well as the recipe. And it's totally going to influence my output. Oftentimes, again, we don't realize that even that objective function has another layer of influence, which is history and values, which is kind of what I just touched on before, right? So what are the what is the context to which this algorithm and these decisions are being made? A predictive model, let's say, to determine the, the risk that a young person is going to experience in life or, or, or whatever outcomes they're going to have, is it in the context of a society that actually is committed to meeting the needs of young people and addressing inequality or criminalizing young people? And that's questions that we have to ask ourselves. And in my work, I see a lot of time asking that of researchers and the people who, who go on to develop these algorithms. Um, so I'm gonna give some more examples. So next slide, please. Just so folks can have a, like a better picture of what I'm talking about. Yeah, well, well, this is a slide kind of breaking down again what predictive analytics refers to. And it's a very specific use of analysis, in particular machine learning, to predict what will happen in the future. Um, I'm gonna get into some examples, but one of the most famous examples of predictive analytics is the use of PredPol, which is a um, predictive analytics software used by uh, Chicago Police Department in order to, to determine who's going to commit a crime and identify hotspots for crime. Right, so researchers at the Human Rights um, research and um, data analysis group, HR DAG, have done a lot of research into actually getting access to that algorithm and breaking it down and showing how it was flawed. But I think even before they had to do all that work, folks in the community knew that this was a way to only reinforce the often abusive and brutal police practices that were already in, being enacted in Chicago. Instead of you know complying with folks' demands to say, hey, let's retrain police and let's think about community policing. So the most important piece about predictive analytics is that its focus is on develop, deciding future trends and making decisions about what will happen next. Um, next slide. So one of the, my favorite examples to talk about in terms of algorithms and the use of big data and how it's um, being rolled out right now is FICO credit scores. Most people don't know, but uh, FICO stands for Fair and Isaac Corporation. It was started by Bill Fair, an engineer, and Earl Isaac, a mathematician, um, all with the idea that they wanted to use big data to influence the world, specifically around financial tech and, and, and finances. And, you know, when we use FICO credit, score out, FICO credit scores, we're often told that our credit score, right, the output, that's the score, is determined by, right, so when we say determine, there is an algorithm that has to determine it, is determined by, let's say, 10% mispayments, 40% debt, whatever, you know? And then the inputs are uh, data that's shared from Equifax, TransUnion, and Experian, as well as other sources, increasingly social media, right? And the problem with this is that, A, credit scores are being used more and more and more now to influence housing, and, um, whether or not people will, will even be hired for a job. So em employment, borrowing, right, having fair lending. And again, if we look at the data and we actually look at some of the research that people have done, right, they, they did a study looking at 80,000 people and saw that there were market differences in credit scores between African-Americans and whites, even when you were controlling for income and the amount of debt, right? Because the increase in debt usually means in increase in credit score because you have to have a debt to have a good credit score. So there's so much research happening about it. But again, because FICO is a proprietary algorithm, we can't actually get under the hood to understand what's really happening. We don't really know, right? But I think that's why it's important of, of a work like Data for Black Lives and other folks who are organizing not just to come up with alternatives to this, but to expose um, kind of the inner working some more. Next slide. Another popular example um, is risk assessments, right? And I, and I know that folks have been hearing some of the news around cash bail, amazing work all over the country by, by folks organizing to end cash bail. 
But we also have to keep organizing to make sure that the cash bail industry is not replaced by the risk assessment industry. Risk assessments are also the use of algorithms in order to determine how long people are incarcerated, right? We, we, all, we all know, most of us know that people don't really have trials before juries anymore. Most of these things happen in plea and increasingly with risk assessment. And, you know, ProPublica did a really good job of exposing this when they talked about us lifting up a story of a 15 year old black girl who got a longer prison sentence for like a, you know, like a neighborhood stolen bike kind of situation than a white career criminal. Because according to the risk assessment, she was at higher risk for recidivism. Now let's kind of dig into some of the questions that this risk assessment actually includes. And this is developed by Compass, again, a private company who is contracted by many, 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 many um, municipal governments and local governments in order to use their risk assessment software and questionnaires. Some of the questions are, for example, um, how often have you moved in the last 12 months? How many of your friends or acquaintances have ever been arrested? How often do you feel bored, okay? Strongly disagree, strongly agree. A person has a right to steal. And I think for me, the most troubling, one of the most troubling and of the most, one of the most clear proxies for race is have you, were you ever suspended or expelled from school? Literally, according to this risk assessment, I should be spending time in jail, right? Because of my life experience that says, all, I check out for all of these things. So again, when we're thinking about data, one of the things I wanna also uplift that I think Marika touched on too is, what kind of data is being used in order to build this predictive model, right? Most of the data that we deal with, most of the data that's collected is already biased to begin with, right? If we think about childhood suspensions, one of my favorite things about the school campaign was the work over the last five or 10 years to really reframe the conversation around suspensions, right? That we don't have a dropout problem, we have a pushout problem. So whenever I talk to researchers and I say, let's stop using dropout as a way to determine, you know, uh, school suspensions or determine like people's outcomes, use pushout because it actually really reflects what's happening in the schools. Next slide, please. I think a final example that I'll end with is on um, child welfare algorithms. And there are two examples that I usually share, one of which was recent in, in Chicago where they were using a system um, kind of similar to what they're trying to do in Ramsey County where using administrative data from the social services organizations to develop a model that will rate by percentage a child who's in the child services, child welfare system's likelihood of being harmed or even killed. And these numbers would be sent to social workers every day, and their job would be to try to connect with nonprofits and deliver services um, rapidly to these young people, right? There was the the um, actual outcome of that was the fact that over 15 young people in the course of five years lost their lives because the data and because of the model that they had used. And it was found out that the outgoing director of child services, who also had some kind of financial interest in the development of this algorithm, um, he stepped down and, 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 and more information about how much bias and how much was involved in the development of this algorithm actually was exposed. And I like to use this example because it touches on the oversampling problem again, right? And I'm gonna use it, so when we talk about child welfare data, you know, and you're building a model that's pretty much using data, whoever, whoever, whoever data that you have in the system, there's already gonna be bias because honestly, there are many wealthier and in the case of, I think Pennsylvania, Allegheny County white parents who were not in the system. That doesn't mean that they weren't abusive to their kids, they weren't neglectful parents. They just don't use social services, welfare, food stamps, free school lunch that puts them in the system in the first place to then, be a part of a data set that will then train a model to determine the likelihood of risk for other young people, okay? And I think another example of that too is when we think about crime data, right? One of the things that Marika said earlier was that crime data and arrest data were gonna be used. In this country, we don't have a crime data, we only have arrest data. And who are the people who tend to be arrested? That's black people and that's people of color. So when we're talking about crime data, 
we're not talking about white people, we're talking about black people. We have a lot of missing data actually on white crimes because the only way that a full data set would be valid is if we had crime data reflecting everybody. But because of how biased the system is, we don't have that. So I actually think that that is the end of my, um, you can go to this final slide. Um, that is the end of my presentation, but one of the things I wanted to end off in saying with that last example is that there are examples of folks um, in Pennsylvania and in other places in, in, in New Zealand working with communities to develop child welfare algorithms. And we're even working with folks in New York City, um, young people to develop the school en enrollment algorithm. And, you know, I say that because, again, right, Data is a tool of social change. It can be a tool of social change or a weapon of political oppression, depending on whose hands it's in. And I really encourage everybody on the webinar to understand that and to equip themselves with information um, and to continue um, finding ways to become literate in algorithms and literate in um, data. So thank you so much. And I hope you guys have some questions. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marika and Yeshi. Um, and we're going to go ahead and open it up for question and answer now. And I have several questions that have come in through the chat box. So I'll go ahead and start with one. But if others, if other participants have more questions, feel free to keep sending them in. Um, so the first one I have is, if you could share more about the type of consequences that family families face if they get a high score in these um, sort of risk assessments. So one of the things that we don't actually know is what is the outcome of the risk scores for our families. It has been presented that they will be connecting folks with um, resources and services. However, we are unclear about what that is because there hasn't been mention of how to actually provide or resource these services or supports. Um, one of the, the concerns that we have as a consequence, again, is the overstigmatization of children. And that um, I think of a personal story um, when I was working with a young person where I, I was showing up at the school and, um, and, the, and the, the, the receptionist, at, uh, the school receptionist, I kept asking who I how, who I was meeting with and what child I was meeting with. And when I finally said the name, um, the the adult was just like, oh, that child. So it's also like children could be identified before they even had these behaviors and were already struggling with adults that put children in a box because of these behaviors. It might mean like a lot of it might be in invisible consequences. Schools may be less willing to support some families because they believe that they're deserving of their circumstances. Um, it might be that folks are having um, less resources directed to them based on what type the what the risk score is, but what type of uh, concerns they have about the risk. The thing is, you know, there's a risk score that can come from this predictive algorithm, but we already know that adults identify children at, at risk based on their perception of them. So the way that they interact and behave with them can be concerning um, alone. But I'd, I'd turn it over to Yeshi to see if you have any sense of how these consequences could be applied potentially. Yeah, I think you listed a lot of them. I know one of the things you said in our meetings before was the ways in which it could influence funding um, um, for tribal education. I think that's one concrete policy way. And I think just in the examples of what I know, you know, increasingly as automated decision making and algorithms influence all parts of our life, you know, there's a whole smart cities movement, for example. Um, we're going to see people who, the most vulnerable people, being at really at the will of these algorithms, right? In employment, in housing, in child welfare, you know, really. And I think folks like Virginia Eubanks and other researchers have done a really good way of, of kind of documenting the ways in which um, more and more and more social services and government services and even public education increasingly is going to be um, affected by this. And I think 
whether it's having a longer jail sentence just because an algorithm decides that or having to pay more for car insurance because an algorithm decides that you live in a more dangerous, also known as, you know, racially coded like neighborhood. Um, those are all impacts, but I think um, it really depends on, on, on where you live and who you are. I think, I think it also speaks to collateral damage in the juvenile justice system. So you may have a young person that it's their first interaction with the juvenile justice system, but because they have a higher risk score, they might be more likely to receive a harsher punishment or term simply because with the risk score, well, we expected you to be here. We've just been waiting. Thanks, I'll share um, another question. So we got a couple questions that were about um, finding information about this in people's local states. So uh, one question was about a website, Marika, that you referenced early on um, to look up research. Do you know which website that was? So this is the National Council on Crime and Delinquency is who um, Ramsey County has entered into the agreement with and by way of the Joint Powers Agreement, all of the entities are now working with the National Council on Crime and Delinquency. So I encourage people to check out their website because again, when we're talking about what they are providing, it's a pilot and a study. They don't actually have the answer to what the algorithm needs to be in order to be on the prevention side for the risk, risk assessment. Um, so there's that. Great, and, and building off of that, are there other places or strategies people can use to find out if there are agreements like this in their state? We had someone from Cal North, Cal North Carolina asking if there's a way to figure this out in their state if something's happening, but also are there any buzzwords or other things people should be aware of uh, to keep an eye out for something like this happening where they are? Well, I think one of the things that you'll need to consider, like in Minnesota specifically, this is wrapped around a joint powers agreement, but you could have predictive analytics that's happening just in the school district by itself. So what I would do is like, it actually was pretty hard to find all of these documents, even though they're, they're from um, uh, government agencies and they're required to report. So it can be pretty difficult to identify them and find them. But the way I would start um, is looking for a joint powers agreement to just identify what joint powers agreements um, exist at the county, city, and school level uh, just by typing those in. I would also go directly to um, the research and evaluation departments in school districts um, because they are also usually in partnership with managing the data. Um, I think that you can go to the ombudsperson and your district or in your government agency and ask um, and give ask them to give a tally of what are the joint powers agreements, um, what are the predictive analytics. Another way that we've been able to identify where it exists is by looking at budgets. Um, it doesn't always show up completely transparent, but in the board minutes of your uh, of your school board, it might identify that they're going to be allocating resources because for in, for us in Minnesota. Each of these entities are going to be making a financial contribution to this new independent entity. So that's how you're actually able to track um, where it's happening. There aren't a great deal of buzzwords other than, like, like we've said, the risk, risk assessments, the predictive analytics. Um, um, so Yeshi, do you have any suggestions? Um, yeah, I think, as you said, it's like really hard to kind of no, even when you're dealing with an algorithm half the time, um, especially since, uh, especially if the focus is on like the, the, the creation of some kind of score or rating system. But I do think sometimes it is worth to um, do all the steps that you laid out, Marika. But honestly, if, if you see predictive analytics come up at any point, <laughs> that's a red flag. And I think honestly being proactive and, and reaching out to folks that you might know within your school district or even if you don't know them and asking them ahead of time. Honestly, I would not be surprised if that would be the first time they had heard about it. We have so many examples of how, for example, in, in New York State, um, they were using an algorithm to, just, to de determine the hiring and firing of teachers. And even the superintendent and folks in the administration did not know it was an algorithm. And, it was, and when it was discovered, it was one the algorithm was owned by a separate company and they had no um, no even clue 
about what the model was and again, what was under the hood. So um, sometimes just going in and asking cold like that can actually make a big difference. And I just thought of another piece as one of our parents mentioned that at the beginning of the school year that you're given the stack of agreements as parents to sign off on. And so being very intentional about reading them um, because uh, the data privacy, there is uh, FERPA and you need to make sure that the school district has communicated with uh, parents and, and 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 students about these decisions. So it might not be explicit, but if you are share, um, signing off on some type of agreement, you might want to follow up and say um, whether it specifically is around technology. You want to be clear about what it, it entails and encompasses. Great, thank you both. Um, we have a whole lot of questions come in, so I'm just gonna keep on going with the questions. Um, we had one earlier that came in about um, if you could talk about measurement invariance in the design. I don't know if that's something that either of you are familiar with. If not, we can. Yeah, I'm familiar with the term. That's a research term that's used to kind of determine whether or not we see um, the same occurrence among different groups, like for example, test scores. I think that's a great question, but I think, you know, before we kind of get into the math and into the data science, I think it's important to know that um, even as we are using different kind of data strategies or research strategies to, even in our own way, kind of in, in investigate the, the validity of models and, even get into the weeds around that, it's important for us to kind of take a step back and like really do this work. But if anybody wants to talk about that offline, I think that's a very technical thing. Um, maybe that's something that we can kind of get into on the next webinar, that's like a whole other webinar. Um, but I think I don't know what the question is related to the joint powers agreement and um, perhaps maybe they mean determining um, whether or not the data that's going to be shared is actually consistent with the people's experiences. I think as of right now, um, that might not be the best way to kind of understand how the bias is, is, is occurring. But again, I'll just stop there. And I think that's, if that's um, I would need more information about that question and probably dedicate some more time to actually answering that. Sure, and I think that um, Yeshi and Marika's emails are up on the screen. So um, if the person who asked the question wants to follow up directly and you know engage in a conversation, I know the presenters are definitely open to that. Um, so we have a bunch of questions that came in about um, how to use data as a tool for change. So I'll share a couple of those. Uh, one person asked, are we looking to do away with the data collection altogether or would we be more open to having data collection shift towards teachers in schools that need resources, but leave the children out of those kinds of equations? So that's one question. I can nope. answer that. Oh, go ahead, Marika. No, no, go ahead, please. <laughs> okay, yeah. You know, and this is why I like to share my story. I, You know, as I mentioned, the first time I ever did data collection was at a, as, a, as a 17-year-old, as a youth organizer at Power U. And we did that data collection on our own because after many instances of going to the school board and talking about the suspensions in our schools and the arrests and the police brutality and literally kind of being like kicked out of the, like the school board public hearing meetings, um, we had to turn to data as a way to reflect what, what was a very urgent issue in our schools. Um, and we actually collected 600 surveys um, and that information was used to start to, to have um, to make a comic book. And that comic book is still online at Power Youth Center, telling it like it is. And later on, I have other stories of, of work that I did that was very similar, where we were, a, we, we were really able to use data to not just um, create new data that otherwise didn't exist that was important. You know, we were trying to fight to end the school to prison pipeline. You guys know this at a time before Obama and, and folks federally really started using that language and certainly not restorative justice, right? So, but most importantly, you know, that comic book was was used not just in Miami, but by organizers from all over who said this was really helpful in us telling our own stories. 
And I think, you know, when it, term, when it comes to young people and when it comes to parents, I do believe that data collection is important. I think within our organizations, we have data. Sometimes that data is not, you know, quantitative data. Sometimes that's just people's stories and experiences, and we have to treat that as being just as valuable. I also believe that there's a lot of power in training young people to do data collection, kind of like how I was trained. But I also think that, you know, we, we've been in a lot of conversations as Data for Black Lives around privacy. I think the, the privacy conversation, fortunately, is shifting. Folks are trying to shift it from this more privileged stance of, you know, I don't want anybody in my business to, to the realities of what most of our folks are experiencing, where if you attend a public school, if you work at a government job, if you receive any kind of services, you know, you're going to be in the system. God forbid you you had had any contact with the criminal justice system, which is what most of our folks are experiencing. You're going to be in the quote unquote system and how that's a real privacy issue. So I think to that end, absolutely. Um, when big data is being used to kind of, again, reinforce and recriminalize and do this collateral damage that Marika mentioned, it absolutely should be done away with um, and change. But I also think that I've seen so many awesome examples of how people have been able to partner with folks locally and, and in local government and in school districts to say, you know what, we're going to redesign this algorithm or we're going to make different kind of demands on how our data is used and we're going to ask for more transparency and, you know, kind of a plug to our next Data for Black Lives conference is January 11th to 13th at the MIT Media Lab. And a big part of that um, opening panel and, and part of the work there is my hope is going to be kind of showcasing and really telling stories of how people are using data, whether it's GIS, whether it's our studio, whether it's machine learning algorithms um, to advance racial justice and, and equity um, in their communities. And I think you did a great job of answering that question. For us locally, the most immediate issue is how expansive the scope of, of the data that is being shared. And I think that brings more attention to how ill-equipped our elected officials are in making yeah. decisions around data, because I cannot imagine that if they understood the magnitude of this agreement, that they would have given everything absolutely away. And so it's more about, like Yeshi said, identifying how data can be used for good, but it's also about educating people about um, how to manage the process and really getting deep and understanding what it is that you're giving away with that data. Um, because literally they gave the bad the babe through they gave the babe, baby and the bathwater all together. So it's around having a um, a system in place that really helps you define and refine what it is that you're committing to and not committed committing to yourself personally but what you're giving away for all these families and young people that have absolutely no say in it marika this question builds on what you just shared so i'll just read it in case there's anything else you'd want to add um, but there's sort of a question about the joint powers agreement specifically and if it could shift and be more community-led and community responsive um, it could, you know, could it be a tool for holding schools accountable instead of a weapon of heightened surveillance? So what sorts of processes are you looking to have in place uh, so that the structure would be more supportive of families and protective of people's data? Is there data that would still need to be shared just between the named parties, but could be uh, more protected? So I don't know if there's anything else you want to add to that. Yeah, one of the things, again, that we learned about this data piece is that the data that they have committed to sharing is identifiable data rather than aggregate, which again is much more personalized. Um, and I think, again, I just want to be clear that right now, because of the bad and ill-informed decisions that have been made, our goal is just to disband and dissolve this. But that does not mean that we as a community are not ready and willing to sit down at the table and talk about what it is that we need to address the risks and the disparities that exist within the, stu uh, the system, not from the perspective of students being at risk, but from the disparities that the system perpetuates. Um, I think also when we talk about that data is again, um, there's this distinction of who actually gets to see what the data is and so if you're setting up a structure where families and community members have no clue about what it is that's being shared there's no way that they can actually protect themselves and so until we find a way to have a conversation 
that it's not just contributing recommendations, but that community and, 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 and families are allowed to participate in the process the whole way through. Um, I don't think we're ready to take that step yet. There was another specific question about um, the agreement uh, in Minnesota. Um, if it authorizes the municipalities and agencies to hire private companies to develop those systems, and if so, are the companies' names, are they named, and any other information about that kind of contracting out to private companies? Yeah, I mean, our systems and our, our, our districts do not have the capacity to do this on. This is like enormous um, pieces of information. I think eventually that might be the case that districts and entities can do that on their own. Um, but as I was exploring the National Council on Crime and Delinquency, I was disappointed to see the level of transparency about the work that they're doing. And so I don't have a great deal of knowledge or understanding about these private companies that are um, doing this work. But what I do understand is that, um, that this is a pilot and that this is a study and that's something that they're trying to expand and that there is absolutely an economic benefit from for them doing so that is way far beyond any of their concerns around prevention or supporting at-risk students. Great. Um, there were a couple other questions that came in, which I think you both already answered a bit, but I'll give you a chance in case there's any other examples you'd want to add. Um, one was an example of data analysis uh, in an effort for change locally. And so, Yeshi, I know you talked about that with your work at Power U and other places. And then there was also an example about community members um, fighting against biases found in government initiated algorithms. And if there's any examples of campaigns that you'd want to share. So just opening it up in case there's more you want to offer on, for either of those two. Yeah, I can add some. Um, so, one, so one of the things I mentioned were the school enrollment algorithms. So this is another thing that you guys, if you're working in education, should really look out for. We're um, in, in Boston and in, in New York City, the school administration's uh, kind of in this kind of school choice privatization lean has been using and enacting enrollment algorithms, actual automated processes to determine which students are gonna go to which schools, right? And in the case of Boston, it was found that obviously not surprisingly, the school enrollment algorithm home-based, which is focused was to get young people to go to school closer to home, kind of a response to all the busing and all the young people having to travel all over the place to go to school, that it was reinforcing segregation, right? And I think this was a case where the algorithm itself may not have been segregating schools, but it was only reinforcing histories of segregation that have been a part of Boston. And um, in the case of New York City, where this is also happening in, in New York City. So we're working with folks both, both in Boston, some parents locally, um, as well as some students in New York to um, kind of push back in different ways, but de depending on the political context. So in New York, they've been organizing for a while and we, we connected them with some, with some data scientists, folks who are machine learning experts, who are part of our network of 4,000 scientists um, to work with the young people to actually redesign the school enrollment algorithm. It was first developed by like a Nobel Peace Prize winning MIT professor who obviously didn't go to public school, but like, um, they're currently doing that. And I think in Boston, the response is different. There's a lot of political changes that are happening with the superintendent. So it's been really about really digging down and, and educating parents, building up a coalition of folks on the ground um, and thinking about the ways in which not just the algorithm, but that we really push for school equity in general in Boston because again of the histories of, of segregation. And I think that's just an education um, there's examples of folks you really trying to, as I said before, rethink the FICO credit score algorithm. There's people who are um, thinking a lot about transportation and, and changing that. But again, um, one of the best ways to find out about this and to actually meet these people is by joining us either online or in person at the Data for Black Lives conference. Great, thank you. Um, Building on this conversation, there were also a couple questions about um, taking action. So one question was about where the Week of Action events were located. So I can briefly share that um, as part of the National Week of Action from October 20th to 28th, there'll be um, communities around the country that are holding different kinds of events, community forums, actions, uh, and we'll be having a national event in Chicago uh, focused on um, 
working with the school district and police department to reduce criminalization of students. And so Marika, I don't know if you want to share any more about events that might be happening in Minnesota as well. Sure, we are going to be hosting uh, another community forum. We held one a couple weeks ago that uh, we had elected officials and uh, community members attend. But on the 23rd or the 25th, we're still uh, finalizing the details. We'll be holding a community forum um, where we can again have community members talking about their concerns. And our goal is really around equipping parents and community members to have this conversation with this nuanced technological um, um, technological language. One of the concerns that we've had locally is that a lot of our families are feeling overwhelmed just by like the title of something like the cradle to prison algorithm, feeling overwhelmed by what is an algorithm amidst all the other concerns that we navigate as families and community members on a daily basis. So our forum will be focused on that on the 23rd and the 25th. It'll be one of those two dates, but we'll be posting our information on the Dignity in Schools website. So you can certainly check that information out there. Great, thank you. Um, we also got a question. Um, if either of you are aware of any efforts to bring professional ethics to the field of predictive analysis that's happening? Yeah, I, one of the groups that I mentioned, um, the human rights data analysis group, I'm going to put in the comments. I think when I add to the chat, though, it's only going to organize, but maybe somebody can share it. This is, a, this is an article in USA Today that they wrote about uh, PredPol, and they're actually a, been a huge part of the Data for Black Lives movement. They were at the conference when, when we started. Um, groups like them, as well as, honestly, there's not really that many because it's, it's kind of emerging. Um, but I think in addition to obviously Data for Black Lives, I would say HR DAG. And I think there's, there's, there's a lot of people who are kind of isolated all over the country who are working on this, who are writing and doing research. Our goal is to get everybody organized and connected and also involved in some of the advocacy and policy change as well. But check out um, HR DAG. And I think locally here, one of my goals is that we are really going to have a community conversation about what our ethics or our, our expectations are around ethics so that we are part of the process of informing what those um, ethics emerge to be. Because again, uh, when I look around at who's making the decisions at the table right now, we don't have any experts in this content area. And so it's twofold, is getting folks informed and educated around the language and then the concerns they have about um, what the data can actually share or not share, and then having community members involved in building these ethic, eth ethical approaches and practices um, that we can push as a community with the public entities that are extending re public uh, dollars and resources towards um, lifting up. Great. Um, I'll also just share a comment that someone sent us, which is interesting. Um, they shared they were looking at their child's I update form right now and saw on the front page of the I agreement, there was a protection of pupils rights amendment that states the categories that a family can opt out of. Um, mm. and so just suggesting that we look more into that, the PPRA. So I don't know if there's anything else either of you wanna add or just an interesting thing to share with everyone. That's very interesting um, because, uh, because the joint powers agreement has just been put into place, uh, that has not been distributed to our families in the school district, but there have been a ton of questions about the opting out. And what I mentioned earlier is the concern is um, the punitive uh, response if families do opt out. So if we're talking about families that uh, need iPads for their students to participate in their schooling, and if they opt out of any of these agreements, what then happens? So these are still questions that are up in the air for us. Great. Um, and one other specific follow-up question. Um, someone asked about a comic book that was mentioned. Was that the Power U comic book that was developed? Or not? Oh, Maybe. did you repeat the question? Sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. Someone asked about a comic book that was mentioned. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can, I can drop the link for that. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> yeah. That would be great. So I can share that um, once you drop it. Awesome. Um, Let's see, so another question that had come in earlier was around parents currently being able to get access 
um, to data that, that is collected and, and even the metadata. Just wondering if, if um, you have examples of way, you know, ways that um, general parents or the public can access some of this data that does get collected. Yeah, locally, that's one of the concerns for us because, again, we can't. We don't get to see it. We don't know. Um, the folks that will be able to do that will be um, a, an appointed manager and then the, um, the, the board that has been established, this new entity, really are the only individuals that will have access. We can't make requests uh, per se and so we will not be able to kind of dig deep and see what's going on in there under the, as, as Yeshi said, under the hood. Yeah. There, the, another question came in about sort of security concerns with the data being protected. Um, and so uh, the question is, even if companies were somehow made to be more transparent, no data is ever truly secure. Uh, and once data is on the internet, there's no way of really pulling it back. Um, so how can we advocate either for less data to be collected or to have more of that parental consent before the data leaves the school? I think that's a really important point. Um, I think it is about managing the amount of data that is shared because once that data is, a bre is breached, the implications are very broad. Like if you are, you know, you have a risk score that is associated with, with you. And if that information goes beyond the smaller community that it is in, intended to inform, uh, we have no control over it. And that really means that we have to be, uh, more um, proactive about protecting it in the front end rather than worrying about how it's stored. Because again, in Minnesota, there is no termination of this data sharing agreement. So that information will be there literally forever. And so at any point, it could be breached. Right. Don't I don't know. I think that's why it's important that when given the opportunity, parents opt out and we also push for more. Um, protections around opting out. I know in addition to the local work that we do, we're doing a lot of work with Facebook around their big data breach and Cambridge Analytica. And one of the biggest hard and hardest things to push for was opting out because of course, as Marika said earlier, data is currency and data is power. So I think collectively, whether it's in education, whether it's online, whether it's when, when we're shopping, more, more pushes to opt out um, and for companies to, again, yeah, like delete people's data um, and to be able to download our, our, our own data and remove it, it's going to be really, really important. And I think, um, yeah, it's important that we, we make those kind of demands. Um, I got one other question that came in. Uh, algorithms and big data are abstract concepts. Any recommendations for mobilizing without jargon? So my immediate reaction, and I've gotten a lot of that response, is that this is the new landscape for education, and this is the language that is and will continue to be used. So we need to give our families techno technological literacy to be in conversation with the folks that are being are making the decisions. What I do think is important that we do a better job of is using that language, giving examples, concrete examples of what it means. And one of the goals of our summit on November 10th here in the Twin Cities is to give parents the opportunity opportunity to practice and role play having conversations using this language because again this is not something that's going away and we don't want it to be used as a weapon against our families because they don't feel competent in having the conversation so it's a both and we need to better um, uh, give examples and use language that can connect it but we need to empower our families to be able to sit toe to toe with policymakers and decision makers and they can they can hold the conversation down and give the elected officials the definition of an algorithm and the implications it has in their life yep yeah i think that's right on i think um again you know it makes guys feel better we have i have meetings with, with elected officials folks on the hill in congress and i explain algorithms um, the same way I talk to my relatives, like my grandma about it, and my grandma might understand that a little bit better because she's directly impacted. So using these stories, but as Marika says, using this as an opportunity to also educate your elected officials and the people who are making decisions 
Um, and of course, in an effort to really kind of realize some different demands around this. So that's all I have to add, but yes. Yeah. But we are open to suggestions if there is language that we can use to bridge from, um, from, to the, the big data, the algorithms and the predictive analytics, because it is intimidating. This is relatively new to me, and I'm still figuring out how to navigate it in my conversations. Well, that is the last of the questions that we had in the chat box, and we've got about four minutes before the hour. So I will um, turn it over to you, Marika, and Yeshi, if you have any final comments that you want to share before we end. What I want to present is that this is the beginning of a conversation. Um, even in the question section, we've, we've uh, raised some ongoing concerns and discussions that need to continue. So I'm really excited about the fact that we're gonna have an ongoing series of, for this webinar. Um, we'll be looking for uh, feedback and additional questions that you may have that can inform our webinar going forward. I wanna thank uh, Yashmabet Milner and the team at Dignity in Schools and all of the community members that have really driven this process to get us to the place we are. I really quickly just want to acknowledge that one of our critical members of our local stop the, co um, the coalition to stop the cradle to prison pipeline, uh, we lost one of our members in the last week and a half, and I just want to raise his name, Ed Owens, up, because this coalition is a, a group of powerful people that are trying to make sure that we are not taken advantage of and that the data currency is ours to control and that others aren't controlling us. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for participating in this webinar. And Yeshi, do you have any closing words that you would like to share? Just thank you for having me and thank you all for the work that you're doing. One of the biggest things I think right now is understanding the times that we're in. And I think we all have an understanding and that's going to lead to more action and more change. So thank you so much, Marika, for your amazing work and for your wonderful presentation and for having me. And for Liz and Tafari and everyone, I'm glad to be back in the DSC space. <laughs> um, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good evening. <laughs>